हेलो वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनुरेखा चारीवाग असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशोलॉजी सावित्री बाई फुले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी आई एम कोऑर्डिनेटिंग द पेपर ऑन सोशोलॉजी ऑफ जेंडर टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द मॉड्यूल टाइटल इको फेमिनिज्म इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल एक्सप्लेन द इंटरकनेक्शंस बिटवीन कैपिटलिज्म एंड पेट्राकी एंड थ्रू इट एक्सप्लेन द लिंकेजेस बिटवीन वुमेन एंड नेचर वी विल ऑल्सो look into the distinct perspectives within ecofeminism further we will also try to look into the concepts of ecofeminism ecology ethics and nature emergence of ecofeminism ecofeminism emerged in 1970s with the increasing consciousness of the connections between women and nature movements all over the world are then dedicated to the continuation of life on earth like the chipko movement in india or green belt movements in kenya are all termed as eco feminist movements these movements point out to the connection between women and nature eco feminism emerged in the west as a product of the peace feminist and ecology movements of the late 1970s and the early 1980s the term eco feminism was coined by French writer Francois Lebon in 1974 it was further developed by King in about 1976 and became a movement in 1980 with the organization in the same year of the first ecofeminist conference women and life on earth ecofeminism in the 1980s at Amherst Massachusetts US According to ecofeminist King ecofeminism is all about connectedness and wholeness of theory and practice it sees the devastation of the earth and her beings by the corporate warriors and the threat of nuclear annihilation by the military warriors as feminist concern it is a same masculinist mentality which would deny us our right to our bodies and our own sexuality and which depends on multiple systems of dominance and state power to have its way Whenever women protested against ecological destruction the threat of atomic destruction of life on earth new developments in biotechnology genetic engineering and reproductive technology they discovered the connections between patriarchal domination and violence against women the colonized non-western non-white people and nature it led to the realization that the liberation of women cannot be achieved in isolation from the larger struggle for preserving nature and life on earth Ecofeminism includes these perspectives that are usually unrecognized in the mainstream focusing on the aspect of exploitation of women and nature through male domination nature of ecofeminism Ecofeminism is based on certain fundamental claims that point out to the existence of important connections between the operation of women and the operation of nature it is essential to understand the nature of these connections in order to understand the operation of women and nature and finally every feminist theory must include an ecological perspective and vice versa Ecofeminism can be defined as a value system as a social movement and a practice which also offers a political analysis that explores the link between androcentrism and environmental destruction. It is an awareness that begins with the realization that the exploitation of nature is intimately linked to the western man's attitude towards women and tribal cultures. For ecofeminists therefore The domination of women and nature is basically rooted in the ideology. In order to overcome this, one needs to reconstruct and reconceptualize the underlying patriarchal values and structural relations of one's culture and promote equality, non-violence, non-hierarchical forms of organization to bring about new forms. According to the ecofeminist, one also needs to realize the interconnectedness of all life processes and hence river nature and all life forms. Humans should not try to control nature but work along with it and must try to move beyond power based relationships. This would mean integrating the dualisms on the polarization of the male and the female in one conception of reality. Importance should also be given the ecofeminist argue to the process rather than only to the goal. The personal is political and hence female private sphere is just as important and applicable to the male public sphere. One needs to change the patriarchal nature of the system by withdrawing power and energy from patriarchy. Ecofeminist ethics Many ecofeminists advocate some form of an environmental ethic that deals with the twin operations of the domination of the woman and nature through an ethic of care and nurture that arises out of women's culturally constructed experiences. At philosopher Karen Warren conceptualizes it, an ecofeminist ethic is both a critique 
of male domination of both women and nature and an attempt to frame an ethic free of male gender bias about women and nature. It not only recognizes the multiple voices of women located differently by race, class, age and ethnic considerations, it centralizes those voices. Ecofeminism builds on the multiple perspectives of those whose perspectives are typically omitted or undervalued in dominant discourses. For example, Chipko movement in developing a global perspective on the role of male domination in and the exploitation of women in nature. An ecofeminist perspective is thereby structurally pluralistic, inclusivist and contextualist, emphasizing through concrete example the crucial role plays in understanding sexist and naturist practice. Merchant explains about a partnership ethic that treats humans as equals in personal, household and political relations and humans as equal partners with rather than controlled by or dominant over non-human nature. Just as human partners, regardless of sex, race or class, must give each other space, time and care, allowing each other to grow and develop individually within supportive non-dominating relationships, so humans must give non-human nature space, time and care, allowing it to reproduce, evolve and respond to human actions. Perspectives of Ecofeminism Different configurations of ecofeminism reflect the different ways of analyzing the connections between women and nature, as well as the differences in the nature of women's operation and solutions to them. Liberal Liberal feminism formed a prominent part of the history of feminism since its beginning in the 17th century until the 1960s, when each individual maximizes his or her own potential, productive potential as optimal society can be made. Thus, what is good for each individual is also good for a society as a whole. Historically, liberal feminists have argued that women do not differ from men as rational agents and that exclusion from educational and economic opportunities have prevented them from realizing their own potential for creativity in all spheres of human life. 20th century liberal feminism was inspired by Simone de Beauvoir, Second Sex, 1949, and Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystic, 1963. De Boer argued that women and men were biologically different but that women could transcend their biology, freeing themselves from their destiny as biological reproducers to assume masculine values. Frieden challenged that I am just a housewife mystic resulting from post-World War II production forces that made way for soldiers to reassume jobs in the public sphere, pushing the reserve army of women laborers back into the private sphere of home. The liberal phase of the women's movement that exploded in the 1960s demanded equity for women in the workplace and in education as a means of bringing about a fulfilling life. Simultaneously, Rachel Carson made the equation of life on earth a public issue. Her Silent Spring, published in 1962, focused attention on the death-producing effects of chemical insecticides accumulating in the soil and tissues of living organism. Deadly exilers that bombarded human and non-human beings from the moment of conception until the moment of death. For liberal ecofeminists, as for liberalism generally, environmental problems result from the overly rapid development of natural resources and the failure to regulate pesticides and other environmental pollutants. Given the equal educational opportunities to become scientists, natural resource managers, regulators, lawyers and legislators, women like men can contribute to the improvement of the environment, the conservation of natural resources and the higher quality of human life. Women, therefore, can transcend the social stigma of the biology and join men in the cultural project of environmental conservation. Cultural feminism developed in the late 1960s and 70s. Cultural ecofeminism is a response to the perception that women and nature have been mutually associated and devalued in Western culture. Sherry Ortner's 1974 article, Is Female to Male as Nature is to Culture, posed a problem that motivates many ecofeminists. Ortner argued that cross-culturally and historically, as opposed to men, have been seen as closer to nature because of their physiology, social roles and psychology. Physiologically, women bring forth life from their bodies, undergoing the pleasure, pain, stigma attached to menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth and nursing, while men's physiology leaves them freer to travel, hunt, conduct warfare and engage in public affairs. 
Socially, childbearing and domestic caretaking has kept married women close to the hearth and out of workplace. Psychologically, women have been assigned greater emotional capacities with greater ties to the particular personal and present than men who are viewed as more rational and objective with a greater capacity for abstract thinking. To cultural ecofeminist, the way out of this dilemma is to elevate and liberate women and nature through direct political action. Many cultural feminists celebrate an era in prehistory when nature was symbolized by pregnant female figures, trees, butterflies and snakes and in which women were held in high esteem as bringers forth of life. An emerging patriarchal culture, however, dethroned the mother goddesses and replaced them with male gods to which female deities became subservient. The scientific revolution of the 17th century further degraded nature by replacing Renaissance organicism and a nurturing earth with a metaphor of a machine to be controlled and repaired from outside. Their ontology and epistemology are viewed by cultural feminists as deeply masculinist and exploitative of a nature historically depicted in the female gender. The earth is dominated by male developed and male controlled technology, science and industry. Often stemming from an anti-science, anti-technology standpoint, cultural ecofeminism celebrates relationship between women and nature through revival of ancient rituals centered on goddess worship, the moon animals and the female reproductive system. A vision in which nature is held in esteem as mother goddesses is a source of inspiration and empowerment for many ecofeminists. Goddess worship and rituals centered around the lunar and female menstrual cycles, lectures, concerts, art exhibitions, street and theatre productions, and direct political action are all examples of the revisioning of nature and women as powerful forces. Cultural ecofeminist philosophy embraces intuition and an ethic of caring and web like human nature relationship. Women's biology and nature are celebrated as sources of female power. Socialist and Marxist. Socialist ecofeminism is a feminist transformation of socialist ecology that makes category of reproduction rather than production central to the concept of a just sustainable world. Like Marxist feminism, it assumes that non-human nature is a material basis of all life and that food, clothing, shelter and energy are essential to the maintenance of human life. Nature and human nature are socially and historically constructed over time and transformed through human praxis. Nature is an active subject and not a passive object to be dominated and humans must develop sustainable relations with it. It goes beyond cultural ecofeminism in offering a critique of a capitalist patriarchy that focuses on the dialectical relationships between production and reproduction and between production and ecology. Socialist ecofeminism and production as producers and reproducers of life, women and tribal and traditional cultures over the centuries have had a highly significant interactions with the environment. Women's intimate knowledge of nature has helped to sustain life in every global human habitat. Under capitalism, as sociologist Abby Peterson points out, men bear the responsibility for and dominate the production of exchange of commodities, while women bear the responsibility for reproducing the workforce and social relations. Women's responsibility for reproduction includes both biological reproduction of the species, intergenerational reproduction and intragenerational reproduction of the workflows through unpaid labor in the home. Here too is included the reproduction of the social relation socialization. Under industrial capitalism, reproduction is subordinate to production. Socialist ecofeminism and reproduction. Socialist ecofeminism focuses on the reproduction of life itself. In nature, life is transmitted through the biological reproduction of the species in the local ecosystem. Lack of proper food, water, soil chemicals, atmospheric gases, adverse weather, disease and competition by other species can disrupt the survival of offspring to reproductive age. For humans, reproduction is both biological and social. First, enough children must survive to reproductive age to reproduce the community over time. Two, many put pressure on the particular mode of production affecting the local ecology. Second, by interacting with external nature, adults must produce enough food, clothing and shelter and fuel on a daily basis to maintain their own subsistence and sustain the quality of their ecological homes. Both the intergenerational biological reproduction of humans and other species and intragenerational reproduction of daily life are essential to continuing life over time. 
Sustainability is a maintenance of an ecological productive reproductive balance between humans and nature, the perpetuation of quality of all life. Feminists debate that women bodies are being turned into production machines, into sites of experiments with Western interest in order to test birth control techniques and devices, contraceptives, even those that are declared as unsafe and banned in Western countries, as well as for in vitro fertilization experiments and so on. Reproductive freedom means freedom of choice, freedom to have or not to have children in a society that both needs them and provides for their needs. Like cultural ecofeminism, socialist ecofeminism protests chemical assaults on women's reproductive health but puts them in the broader context of the relations between reproduction and production. It can thus support point of production actions such as the Chipko and the Greenbelt movements in the third world protest by Native American women over cancer causing radioactive uranium mining on reservations and protests by environmental justice advocates over toxic dumps in urban neighborhoods. Ecofeminism in India Vandana Shiva is one of the most prominent ecofeminists in India. Her work can be categorized as belonging to the radical strand of ecofeminism. However, her critique of the entire development model and its effects on environment places her more on the side of socialist framework. Vandana Shiva analyzes modern science and technology as a western patriarchal colonial project which is inherently violent and perpetuates this violence against women and nature. Pursuing this model of development has meant a shift away from traditional Indian philosophy which sees Prakriti as a living and creative process, the feminine principle from which all life arises. Under the grab of development, nature has been exploited mercilessly and the feminine principle was no longer associated with activity, creativity and sanctity of life but was considered passive and as a resource. This has led to marginalization, devaluation, displacement and ultimately the dispensability of women. Women's specialized knowledge of nature and the dependence on it for staying alive were systematically marginalized under the onslaught of modern science. Shiva, however, notes that third world women are not simply victims of development processes but also poses the power for change. She points out to the experience of women in the Chipko movement in 1970s in the Garhwal Himalayas where women struggle for the protection and regeneration of the forest. Further, she argues along with Maria Mies that whenever women have protested against colonial destruction or nuclear annihilation, they were aware of the connections between patriarchal violence against women, other people and nature. These movements were informed by the ecofeminist principles of connectedness, wholeness, interdependence and spirituality in opposition to capitalist patriarchal science that is engaged in disconnecting and dissecting. It is argued that the ecofeminist position that is subsistence perspective is rooted in the material base of everyday subsistence production of women all over the world. This struggle of women and men to conserve their subsistence base can become the common ground for women's liberation and preservation of life on earth. However, some scholars have highlighted the problems with Vandana Shiva's argument. Gabriel Dietrich points out that Shiva seems to propose a society that is democratically organized where people own sufficient land to survive on its produce. She seems to treat caste factors and political options as non-existent and neglects the realities of hierarchies, subordination, patriarchy and violence within traditional tribal and prison communities. Meera Nanda contends that Shiva has tried to portray the West as inherently vicious and the third world as fundamentally virtuous. She attributes the degradation of nature and the subordination of women mainly to the country's colonial history and imposition of a western model of development. She however ignores the pre-existing inequalities of caste, class, power, privilege and property relations that predated colonialism. In advocating ecofeminist principles of women's special relationship with nature, connectedness, wholeness and so on, Shiva and Mies ignore the question of who acquires knowledge, what knowledge and how. Alternative conceptualizations, Meena Agarwal. Meena Agarwal's feminist environmental perspective is rooted in the material reality and sees the relation between women and nature as structured by gender and class, caste and race, organization of production, reproduction and distribution. Agarwal explains that women's relation to the environment is socially and historically variable. Women, particularly in poor households, are both victims of environmental degradation as well as active agents in the movements of production and regeneration of the environment. 
they act both in positive and negative ways with the environment the growing degradation of natural resources both qualitatively and quantitatively the increasing appropriation by the state and by the private individuals as well as a decline in the communally owned property have been primarily for the increased class gender effect of environmental degradation the decline in the community resource management system the increase in population and the mechanization of agriculture resulting in the erosion of local knowledge system have aggravated the class gender implications of the environmental degradation disappearing forest village common shortage of drinking water and so on have increased women's work as they now have to spend more time and walk longer distances to get fuel fodder food and water drying up or pollution of wells accessible to lower caste women have meant that an increased dependence on upper caste women to dispense water to them the degradation of forest and the historical and ongoing malpractices and the state policies and increasing privatization have resisted restricted the access of villagers to the forest and village commons it has further reduced the number of items that women could gather from forest and village commons that has directly resulted in reduced incomes the extra time spent in gathering has reduced the time available for women for crop production the little that the women earn through selling firewood is also reduced due to deforestation having a direct impact on the diets of the poor household The decline in the availability of fruits berries and so on as well as firewood has forced the people of poor households to shift to less nutritious food and eat half cooked meals meals and even reduce the number of meals eaten per day the existing gender biases within the family lead to women and female children getting secondary treatment with regard to food and health care The displacement of people due to large dams or large scale deforestation has led to the disruption of social support networks within and between villages. Women particularly of poor and rural households who depend largely on such networks for economic and social support are adversely affected and has also eroded a whole way of life and has resulted in alienation and helplessness. The dominant forms of development have led to a devaluation and marginalization of women's indigenous knowledge and skills that they have acquired through their everyday interaction with nature. Simultaneously, they are not trained to use the new technologies and are excluded from the planning process. With degradation and privatization of natural resources, the material base of women's knowledge is declining. Critic. Various feminist scholars such as Cecile Jackson Janet Bell, Meera Nanda, Bina Agarwal have pointed out this economist perspective is ethnocentric, essentialist, blind to class, ethnicity and other differentiating cleavages, a historical and neglects material sphere. Ecofeminist literature portray the historical exploitation and domination of women and nature as going hand in hand and both are seen as victims of development. It is taken as self-evident that any harm to nature harms women equally. and since women are seen as closer to nature than men none of the ecofeminist literature attempts to establish this linkage through concrete evidence or strong argument it is very anecdotal and takes its position as self evident it locates the domination of women and nature mainly in ideology thereby neglecting interrelated material sources of dominance based on economic advantage and political power as well as a gender division of labor and distribution of opportunity These ecofeminist images of women and in fact retain the patriarchal stereotypes of what men expect women to be. They freeze women as merely caring and nurturing beings instead of expanding the full range of human potentialities and abilities. The use of metaphors of women as nurturing like the earth and of the earth as female abound are regressing rather than liberating women and reinforce stereotypes. What these arguments seem to overlook is that concepts of nature, culture and gender are historically and socially constructed and vary across and within cultures and time periods. This essentialism presents women as a homogeneous category both within the countries and across nation and it fails to differentiate among women by class, race, ethnicity and so on. Ecofeminist essentialism fails to put forward any account of historical change in society. Critics like Susan Prentice argue that emphasizing the special relationship of women with nature 
and politics imply that what men do to the earth is bad unlike women thereby ignoring the fact that men too can develop an ethic of caring for nature it also fails to analyze capitalism and its domination of nature hence it cannot develop an effective strategy for change since it ends in polarizing the worlds of men and women while essentializing the two categories historically women's intimate knowledge of nature has helped to sustain life with colonial intervention and capitalist development production in traditional societies was disrupted in conclusion of the module on ecofeminism we have discussed about the emergence of ecofeminism in general and specific to india further we have also discussed the nature of ecofeminism and also examined the relationship in terms of ecofeminist ethics we have also analyzed the different strands of ecofeminism which included liberal radical and socialist further we ended this module with a understanding and analysis of ecofeminism in india